So today we're talking about Jesus being Lord over life and death. Um, let's bow on a word of prayer before we, we start. Lord Jesus, we know that you have a purpose in, in today's message on John chapter 11. And God, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you have authority over life and death. And we just pray as we explore this, the story of Lazarus, God, that you would, um, you would just you would impact our hearts, Lord, and, 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 and show us what you would like us to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're uh, continuing on this journey, and um, the story of Lazarus. Most everyone here that's been in church for a long time has heard the story of Lazarus, or you've read it at home in your personal devotions. Um, it's a story concerning life and death, a story that shows Jesus for who he is and his interaction with some of his closest friends during a very difficult season in their lives. Now, I believe there's nuggets of truth in this story that if we mind them and take them to heart, they will teach us many important things about the character of God and the hope that we have in eternity um, with Him. So, the story is found in the book of John chapter 11, where uh, we'll start with verse 1. So, we'll read verse 1 to verse 3 to start. John chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This is Mary who poured, whose brother Lazarus lay now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So we have here Mary, her sister Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And they were in a village called Bethany. And presumably, um, at the time when this occurred, Jesus was on the east side of the Jordan River. And uh, now, Jesus had some trouble in the area around Bethany. But Bethany um, was dear, near and dear to his heart because he knew he had some really close family friends, friends there. And this family was close to him. They must have really impact, they, Jesus must have really impacted these people to develop this closeness the way it was. And uh, we see in an, another story in Scripture how, um, how Mary had come to Jesus with this expensive perfume and had broken it open and poured it on his feet and, and wiped his feet with her hair as a, as a, as a gesture of, of, uh, of recognizing that he was the Messiah and that he was God in the flesh. Like, God revealed this to her. And, and uh, we, saw th we saw that, how, you know, even Judas Iscariot was upset with uh, how she done that because of all the money it cost for this perfume. But Mary wanted to show Jesus how much she loved him. And Mary and Martha in Bethany, they sent word to Jesus from Bethany that their brother, Lazarus, was extremely ill. And they did this with the implication, I think, that they desired Jesus to come to Bethany and to heal Lazarus, just as he had done with so many other people. Now, the Scriptures continue telling the story in verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. This is an unusual uh, statement that Jesus, that, that was made concerning Jesus. Very unusual. Mary and Martha, close friends of the Lord and Lazarus, they, they had sent to Jesus to get him to come right away because 
there was a serious illness taking place with Lazarus. And Jesus loved this family so much that when he heard that Lazarus needed help, he stayed put and stayed in the same place for two more days. Well, that's odd. If he loved this family, wouldn't he want to go to them right away? Like if you hear someone in your family or someone that you are really close to is sick, usually you're just like, Johnny on the spot, let's go. And particularly with Jesus, I mean, he had been healing the sick all over the place. And, and, and here is his close friends who have a need, a desperate need. You see, sometimes in life we don't always understand the plans of God and how he wants to use something that happens for his glory. Sometimes the plan of God allows for us to be sick when it serves his eternal purposes. But in our flesh, there are times when we feel like God isn't doing something we should, we feel like he should be doing when we ask him. Sometimes it's like our prayers bounce off the ceiling in silence. We may begin to ask questions whether or not he is able to help us in our time of need in these times. Now, now Jesus, he, he delayed his plans to depart for Bethany. And, and his disciples were probably trying to figure out what was going on too. Because, you see, they, they, they were reluctant to go to Bethany for another reason. Evidently, um, you see, the last time that they were in that area, Jesus claimed to be equal with God, and the religious leaders of that place wanted to kill him. And he escaped their, their uh, grasp because it wasn't the time for him to be sacrificed yet. But there was certainly a great danger. And the disciples of Christ thought that Jesus likely was delaying, or they didn't know he was delaying it, that he didn't go when Mary and Martha sent word for him to come because maybe he was afraid that the Jewish leaders would kill him? Well, they said this in, in verse 8. When Jesus decided two days later to go to Bethany, in verse 8 they said, But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you were going back. And Jesus, who had been in Jerusalem, knew what their hearts were set on. He knew it. And the disciples knew how violent the opposition could be against their Lord. But Jesus was not concerned with this. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daylight in the daytime will not stumble, for they see this by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no night. They have no light, rather. See, we need to know the details of this par parable and, and, and look at them very carefully. What Jesus is saying to his disciples is, without the presence of the Son, he has reason to be concerned if he's, a, if he's walking into a path. The path he treads will be on dark uh, ground without light. And they would likely stumble and possibly come to significant harm. So he's saying this. He's saying, it's, when it's daytime, you don't have to worry about stumbling because the sun gives light to the path. And what would stumble you in the dark isn't going to stumble you in the light. You see, the light of illumination on his path um, was himself. See? And his disciples were with him. Jesus said, in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said this concerning himself. He said to his disciples, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
See, the man walking in the light of the sun can't produce light on his own unless he is the Son of God. But the disciples need not worry when they are with the Son of God because the Son of God is the light of the world. And no matter what they're walking into, they're not walking into something that they can't see coming. There's not good, nothing is going to blindside them when they are walking with Jesus. It's the same for you today. There is nothing that will blindside you when you are walking with Jesus. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He leads you on paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now, with Lazarus, and the situation with Lazarus and his disciples, concerning that situation of him going to Jerusalem, you know, the disciples are saying that they're worried for Jesus, that the Jews wanted to kill him, but Jesus knew their hearts. He knows actually that they're afraid for themselves as much as they are for him. So they're at risk for persecution too, and if they're going to kill the Lord, then they're going to possibly kill them or hurt them as well. And Jesus says, you don't have to fear. If you go to Jerusalem with me, I am the Son. And you have nothing to fear. You'll be walking in daylight and I will protect you from the stumbling into the danger that you think that you would face if you walked in there. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. There was a time when the disciples would have stumbled in harm's way. It's kind of like what Jesus said here in this scripture, that likened unto the 12 hours of night that we have in a 24-hour day. There was a time when the disciples were walking blindly. They didn't know. They didn't know what was going on. But now that the Lord was with them, they don't have to worry. They don't have to fear. There's no reason to fear. After he had said this in verse 11, we see, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So now Jesus reveals a glimpse of his master plan. The disciples, they, they were slow to catch what he was planning. And the reason why he delayed his journey to Bethany was to allow Lazarus to be seen by the people as good and dead. They wanted, he wanted Lazarus not just to be a little bit, you know, like dead for a little while. They wanted to be, it to be obvious that he was dead. There could be no room for any kind of question that Lazarus might have been in there and maybe he had, was alive still and then all of a sudden, boom, you know. Uh, they thought he was dead, but he came back to life. His heart started going again and he started breathing. They didn't want, he, Jesus didn't want any of that. See, his master plan was to talk to the people and show the people something about what, about what he could do and who he was. There could be no doubt that Lazarus was dead. So they plan on going to, to Bethany. And then in verse 16 we see Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, well, let us go, that we may also die with him. <laughs> so here, here's Jesus. I mean, this is, this is Thomas, right? Can you identify with Thomas? I can. There's times when I identify with this guy. Jesus has just done some really fantastic miracle in, in, in my eyesight. You know, like I've seen it with my own eyes. And yet I find myself... Um, doubting 
The fact that he is actually Lord over life and death, that he has everything in his hands, even though he's shown me something that shows me that he is in control. Now, this is the same Thomas that doubted Jesus had been raised from the dead. After Jesus raised from the dead, we, that's where his name comes, the nickname comes, Doubting Thomas. He wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead unless he could put his hands on the scars that were left by Jesus' crucifixion. He, 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 he wouldn't believe, and then Jesus showed him and said, put your hands here, put your hand here. See, feel, the, feel my side. Look at the holes that have been placed in me. And what is his response? He's like, my Lord and my God. And he fell down and worshipped him, you know? And, and the Lord says, blessed are they that believe and do not see. You see, folks, sometimes in our hearts we doubt. But God wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust that he knows what he is doing. And sometimes there's things in our lives that we don't understand. And we might never understand some of the things that go on in our lives until the other side, until eternity. But you know, you can place your trust in Jesus because Jesus Christ is trustworthy. And he will, he will carry on to completion the good work that he has started in us. We can be assured of that. We can take that as a promise because it is. And when God makes a promise, God fulfills his promise. We might not see it here and now in this, in this side of eternity. But when we cross over, we're going to see it. There's going to be eternal life. Now, so doubt can creep into us. We can begin to question ourselves when we ask God to come. I have a need, Lord. Just like Mary and Martha, come. And he doesn't come. And they're wondering, well, doesn't he care? He's not showing up at our door. So two days later, they start on the journey. And then we read on in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again on the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. See, Jesus took the time to explain to Martha that he was Lord over life and death. And that God's plan is that even though a child of God might die in this physical realm, that person who believes in him will live even though they are physically dead. This person who lives spiritually by believing in Jesus, in fact, will never die. And the scriptures also have told us, and it is a promise, that to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. Now Jesus, being both the resurrection and the life, when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, the first statement, I am, he's making the statement that he is God. Well, who sent Moses to deliver the, the Israelites from slavery to the Egyptians who to set them free? I am sent them. God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and he told Moses that when they asked who sent him, he should say that I am sent him. And Jesus made this claim the last time he was in this area 
in Judah, in Judah he, was, he made that statement to the Pharisees. I tell you the truth that before Abraham was, I am. And now he is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. It means when his children leave this physical world, they are transported to another realm where they will experience everlasting life. And this was the purpose in the Messiah coming to the earth. You see, God's desire is that he should collect a harvest of people to bring with him into everlasting life. That's what this whole test and trial in this world is all about. God loves us and he wants us to come to him. And he wants us to to be with him. And he, he longs to gather us into his barn, per se, because you don't have a long time here in this world. God allows you to be here to give you a choice. But he longs to gather you into his eternal arms where you will be with him forever and ever. It's true. Jesus was born into the world to teach us what God was like. He was God with skin on, with human skin on. He, he came to teach us and all the teachings that the disciples heard here from the Lord over the past l- length of time were given to them to show them the heart of God, what God was like. But more importantly, God was there to redeem them. God came into the world to save the world through Jesus, to give people the opportunity to be gathered into his barn, to be redeemed. I am the resurrection and the life, said the Lord. Jesus came to die instead of us so that his offering on the cross would take the penalty of our sins upon his shoulders. Jesus paid the full price for the sins of every man, woman, and child in the world, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God did not come to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the scripture and this is what Jesus is saying. He came. He came to be the Lamb of God. The sacrificial Lamb of God that could take away the sin of anyone who believes in Him. To as many as believed, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. Children born in the Spirit. So, his plan is to lead us into eternity. And he displayed the fact that he is Lord over life and death here in this case. See, this is, we're going to be talking a little bit later in the series here about how Jesus goes to the cross and that how he shows that he is Lord over life and death. When he's talking to Martha here and he says, do you believe that if you die, you will live in me? And she says what? She says, I believe that you are God's Messiah sent into the earth. Wow. See, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and he's the first fruits of the resurrection. But he displayed the fact that he is Lord and that he is the resurrection and the life here with Lazarus. His purpose was not to raise Lazarus up in the physical here and now so that Lazarus could live eternally in his physical body. No, Lazarus was raised as a sign to the world that Jesus was who he said he was. The whole reason why God does miracles is to get people's attention to show the fact that he is who he is. That he is the great I am. Not to preserve Lazarus' life so that Lazarus could eternally live in the physical body. Kind of like the Holy Grail. You know, you hear these stories about the Holy Grail. and You know, there's all kinds of uh, movies and stuff written about the Holy Grail. How how if you drink from the the cup of Christ that that you'll have eternal life in this body. And, And 
you know, it, it's an appealing thing. People want to preserve their life here because they think this is it. This is where it's at. I'm telling you, this is not where it's at. The kingdom of glory far exceeds everything that you see around you. The greatest experiences you can have in this life don't shine a little bit even into the glory that awaits. The eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. You see, what we see right now is temporary. But what I'm talking about with Jesus being the resurrection and the life is eternal. Eternal means forever. There will be no more uh, pain or suffering or sorrow on the other side. When we cross over and Jesus resurrects us and gives us a new body, there will be no more suffering. And you will be very much alive. You'll be more alive than you are right now. Everyone here who believes in Christ will be raised and will be given a new body and you will live forever in the presence of God in a paradise that will blow your mind. You won't be able to contain it. You can't even perceive it right now. It's so awesome. This is a promise from God. And God is trustworthy. Now people say, well, that's very fine. You know, I can't see that. How do you know this is true? Because God has shown it to be true in His Word. And if you come to know Christ, the Spirit of Christ gives testimony that He is the great I Am. When you open your heart up to the Lord and the Holy Spirit ministers in your heart, this is a seal to show that you are His. When you come to Christ, if you don't know the Lord, I encourage you to come to know Him because when you open your spirit up to Him, He comes in, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and testifies that you are His. Don't forget in the valley of the shadow of death. Don't forget that the Lord is with you. The valley of the shadow of death is a very dark and lonely place. But the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He will lead you through that valley into His everlasting pasture. And He will wipe every tear from your eyes. After this in verse 28. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet ent- entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had also come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you lain him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. I want you to pay attention to the next verse. It's the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. See, all these people were grieving the loss of their brother. You know, it hurts when people that we love cross over because We long to be with them and there's the separation that occurs. And, 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 you know, they they were weeping for the loss of their brother. And Jesus knew how this hurt them. He didn't weep because he knew that the death had occurred. He wept because he was filled with compassion for all of the people who are weeping and grieving for their loss of Lazarus. He knew that the penalty of sin was death and that death had entered the world because of sin. And he was there to be the sin bearer, but he he wept because he saw the effects of physical death and separation and he saw how it impacted those people. He was stirred by their sorrow. See, your Savior is compassionate and he loves you. 
and he knows that what you have to go through in your life sometimes is very difficult. And, it, and I believe it moves him. He knows it. And then the G- Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Yes, he could have. But Jesus had a greater purpose to serve in Lazarus' death than he did in healing him at that time. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Sometimes on our journey in life in this tent that God has given us to temporarily dwell in, God asks us to do things that do not seem reasonable. But in this case, even though the request seemed as though it was unreasonable, they trusted, they placed their trust in the Lord and they were obedient to Him. So they took away the stone, it says in verse 41. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for, your, for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. My friends, the truth in this record explains to us that the Lord Jesus Christ has power over life and death. And we can trust him with our lives and with our futures. Jesus is, in fact, the resurrection and the life. See, he's not just the resurrection, but he is the very source of life. The Son of God is the light of the world. And if we know the Lord, we will very soon be getting a heavenly makeover. Very soon. How long does it take to go through a year? Like that. Can you believe it? It's already the fall. We're approaching another winter. The older you get, the faster time seems to travel. You're sitting here, maybe this morning you woke up and you looked in the mirror and you went, where did that handsome young guy go? (laughs) And if you're a lady, you're like, where's those crow's feet come from? They're sure there now. Boy, I never used to have those, right? Just yesterday, you were just a child running around without a care in the world, and now you got arthritis and a sore back and a heart condition. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, you see, as Christians, as believers in Christ, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You see, if we put our trust in the Lord, the resurrection and the life, He gives us assurance that He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will be with us to the very end of the age and beyond. See this? He's with us to the other side. And then on the other side, we will be with Him. We will all be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what the Scriptures tell us. The Lord loved us so much that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish. Do you hear that? Will not perish. That means even though you die, yet shall you live. We will all 
be with the Lord. What I'm saying this morning, my friends, is trustworthy and it is true. We can walk confidently in this life and face life's good times and its calamities together because Jesus is the great I am. He is the resurrection and the life. And He has given us His Spirit to walk with us, to lead us through the valley of the shadow of death so that we need not fear evil because He is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort us. Allow the Lord to comfort you in your times of trouble. Give praise to the Lord and glorify His name in times of goodness, in times where the sun seems to be brighter and the flowers seem to be more colorful. Give thanks to the Lord. And when it's dark, give thanks to Him in the same manner. What I'm saying is trustworthy and true. God has placed the light of His Son in this world. And you know what? When Jesus went away, He didn't just leave us when He, re when he ascended into heaven. He said that He would give us another comforter, the Spirit of truth. And when you, when you come into communion with Jesus and you ask Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, he takes away your sin and He takes it away so that He can make a place for Himself to dwell in that is holy. See, God can't dwell in a sin-laden vessel. The sin issue has got to be taken away before Christ can live in you. See, this is why there's no way unto the Father God. There's no way unto your Creator except through Christ. You can't be good enough to gain favor with God on your own. You need the Savior to save you from your sins so that the Holy Spirit can come and live in you. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior and His blood is applied to your life, the sacrificial blood of Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when he, His blood is applied to your heart and your sins are taken away and washed away, it makes a clean place for God to dwell and it's a clean place by grace through faith. God's grace is given to you. That's something, the favor of God that you don't deserve through faith. This is not of yourselves. You can't earn it. You must believe and say, Jesus, have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. And when you do that, His sacrificial offering on the cross is applied to your heart, to your spirit. Your sin is taken and cast as far as the east is from the west, making a place for the Holy Spirit to live in. And when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, now the light of Christ is with you. Even though Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the light of Christ is in you. The Spirit of Christ lives within you. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 5.14 to the ones who place their trust in Him and who follow Him and who have accepted His sacrifice of their lives and who have been filled with the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. He says in Matthew 5.14, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So God has not abandoned us to walk in this world in darkness. He is the light of the world. And the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, lives in you and you now are a lamp. So as you walk, He gives illumination to your path and you can place your feet in the right place. And you know what that means? That means you can trust Him to guide you. You can trust Him to lead you on paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And that path leads all the way to eternal life when you leave this tent behind and you stand before the Lord and He says to you, not because of what you have done, not because you're such a good guy or such a good gal, but He says, welcome Thou good and faithful servant. 
enter into my glory. Why? Because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed upon you. And the light of God has been given to light your way and be part in, indwell you as a down payment guaranteeing what is to come. The Spirit is the guarantee that when you leave this place, you will be with Him forever. Amen. Let us pray. Music team, if you could come forward. Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you are the resurrection and the life. You are Lord over life and over death. And God, you served your purposes with Lazarus back in those days. Lord, you served your purpose to show people that you are the master over life and over death. And that even though those who believe in you should die physically, God, we shall live. And nothing can separate us from the life that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for the light of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We pray, Lord, that we would not be discouraged when we find ourselves walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that we would not fear any kind of evil, Lord, but we would know confidently that you are with us, that you will lead us safely through. Lamb of God, you came into this world to give yourself as a sacrifice for our sins so that we, in turn, wouldn't face your wrath for our sins, but we would have life and have forgiveness and of grace and peace. God, I pray for your grace and peace to rest upon each person. And I know we pray this every week, but we really mean it, Lord. We need your grace to live by. We need your peace, God, in the midst of life's storms that come our way because there's a lot of things we don't understand and we don't know how to handle on our own. So we just lay it down before you, God, and we, have, we say, have your way, O oh God. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our hearts. Take us, Lord, into your arms and walk with us. Live in us, Lord. Live through us, O oh Lord. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?